I'm so excited to have on Roselle Ellis. He's a police officer in the community that he grew up in. After college and a professional career in basketball, Roselle chose to become an officer, a job that he said that he has always wanted. He has a super strong presence in his patrol work and is someone that the community looks up to. So Roselle, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. You have an awesome, unique background. Um, you know, you've got a sports background, which of course I love, and we got to ride together a little bit on patrol, didn't we? Yes, we did. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to start off by saying thanks for having me. Oh. And, uh, yeah, it, it was fun riding with you. You were a great partner. You know, I looked, I looked up to you in a lot of situations, you know? Yeah, but I you're like that. six, eight. So how is that possible? <laughs> yeah, it's a six, eight, but still when it came down to fighting crime and doing the things that we needed to do on the street. <laughs> I like the presence that you had and uh, just the confidence that you gave me knowing that I had a strong partner willing oh. to engage and have my back. So I appreciate all that. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, Lexi and I have known you, yeah, for a bit in the department and uh, Lexi got to know you a little bit more over the summer, right, Lex? Yeah, Rizal and I have uh, been able to work together on some just sort of side projects with the community, trying to build some bridges and, you know, communicate instead of yell at each other, so... It's been great. <laughs> so Roselle, why don't you tell us a little bit about kind of your background and what drew you to police work? Uh, well, just growing up in Seattle, um, we used to walk to school, me and a group of friends on our way to elementary school and uh, the police would always pull up, you know, or we would run into them in the neighborhood on our way to school and they would always roll down the window and, hey guys and girls, how you doing? You know, great job staying out the street. Um, following the rules of the road and things like that. And so just growing up as a kid, you know, they pull up and you see the lights on the car. And so that was cool to us. You know, they would engage with us and speak with us and started passing out football cards and basketball cards. And so every day on the way to school, we're looking for them like, okay, let's take the same route. Let's see if they're coming back again so we can get to know them and get to meet them. So just having that interaction with police at a young age really left an impression on me and therefore it, it made me start looking for them you know understanding that they're good humans of the community just like I want to be you realize that people are going to think you're full of shit like that that <laughs> story like people are like oh cops don't do that kind of stuff but can you do you remember was it like it just a, a handful of individuals or was was it just like a the broad scope or what, the, the same officers all the time basically well, when I was young, it was a, a officer friendly program and there mm -hmm. was a select group of officers, but um, just, and it didn't matter to us who it was, it, white, black, woman, man, when they drove up and we seen like, hey, how you doing? You know, we were the first one to initiate it, you know, sometimes, and they would always pull over and roll down the window and speak to us on our way to school. So just, like I said, that interaction right there alone, let us make our own assumption and opinions of who those people were. You know, like I said, yeah, some people might not believe me or be like, oh, yeah, I'm full of shit or whatever. But this is my story. This is how yeah. I grew up. This is what I related to. You know, when I was growing up, firefighters, police officers, doctors and lawyers were people that you looked up to, people that you inspired to be like when, once you got older. And so seeing those people and talking to them, that just made me believe like, oh, I can be one of these guys one day instead of like, oh, no, he's a bad guy. No, I, I want to drive that car. I want to be the one to get on a loud speaker and talk. So that was just my little interaction. And I enjoyed that. Now that you are a police officer, is that stuff that you carry into how you interact on a database, day to day basis? Oh, yeah. And then I definitely use that to engage with the kids in the community because I don't care who you are, what size you are. If you get a chance to talk on that mic in the police car and have your voice come over that PA, you want to do it. So when I go to schools and I talk to little kids, first thing I do is bring them out there, let them go through the police car, look at the lights, turn on the lights. Oh, yeah, look, that's cool. Oh, you want to say something? Oh, and then get on there and say something to their friends or to the teacher. And that just opens them up and they just totally forget that I'm a police officer. Now it's fun. Oh yeah, now he's a cool person. So it's just that engagement, you know, open them up, let kids have fun and see that we had like to have fun as well. Did you, so you worked um, in patrol and then you went over to a uh, school resource officer, right? And that, you know, in my mind, that was like a perfect fit for you. And um, that was 
a huge reason you got into police work in general and kind of like you're saying, reaching out to kids and um, creating those relationships with them and that trust, uh, you know, putting them, putting yourself in a school, that's like, you're, you're going to have the most bang for your buck in that situation. So can you talk about like your experiences there? Was it, was it a challenge? Was it, um, you know, what are some kind of like the, were there any politics behind it? Like what, what was your experience there? Well, uh, yes, there was a lot of challenges that I overlooked or I didn't account for going into working at the school, but it, it was cool because now I had to take a step back and being out of high school so long and being, I don't have teenagers, I have little kids and I've never been around teenage girls before. I've been around teenage boys growing up, but just being around teenage girls, like, damn, what did I walk into here in this high school? So there was a lot to learn quick. So, but it was cool. I just went in and I was being myself. Um, my mentor before I took the job was Officer Benny Radford. Mm -hmm. So uh, Benny Radford was a cool person. He gave me a heads up on how school can be, how to deal with the parents and the teachers and things like that. And so I just said, I have some big shoes to fill, but I know how to do this job. I'm just going to go in and be me. And that's the only person that I can be is myself. And I'll let them gauge who I am from there. And so going into the school, I just started to meet and greet people every day. I told them what I expected of them. And I told them what I was there for. And after that, you know, first you get a few kids that looking like, oh yeah, here's the police. I don't want to deal with this guy. I don't want to get to know him. But then after they start hearing a few things about me, because growing up here in Seattle, I knew a lot of the parents of the kids. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the kids didn't know that. So mm -hmm. they go home and, oh yeah, we have this new officer at our school named Roselle Ellis. And then one of their parents will vouch for me. Oh, yeah, he went to this school or we grew up together. Then the kid comes back with a different opinion. Oh, well, my mom says she knows you or my dad said he knows you. And therefore, that gives me kind of like credibility now. And then, you know, some kids that play sports at school. I never went to the school telling them I played sports or anything like that. I always allowed them to go do their own research or homework and find out a little bit about me. And then I think that helped me out a little more to gain their trust because I didn't come to them preaching, well, I did this, I did that. Once they found out what I did, then I think that opened the door for them to be more like, oh, well, he's like us, he plays sports, he gotta be a cool person. So yeah, it all worked for me. I think one thing that was interesting when you first took that position, we talked about it, uh, some resource uh, officers kind of wear polos and downplay their kind of officer role. And, and you said that you really wanted to walk in there in uniform. Um, can you speak a little bit about what, why that was important for you? Yeah, it, it was important for me because the uniform speaks volume and I don't want to walk into the school like, like an undercover or something like that. I want everybody to understand, I wear this uniform, this is my job, and this is what I'm here for, you know, and therefore it's still that engagement you know when some people look at that uniform they have their own different opinions or whatever but if they constantly see me every day and then they get to know the person behind the uniform then i think that speaks volume and then in their defense and in my defense i even tell the kids when i'm speaking to them well i have this uniform on so when people try to approach the school who doesn't supposed to be there now they see the presence they don't have to walk up and thinking I'm just maybe a faculty member or just somebody up there. They see the uniform long before they hit that front door. So when they're when they see me coming towards them and they're coming towards that door and we have our interaction now, they understand. And then the kids get to see that. Oh, well, he is here to protect us. He is here to keep the people who don't suppose to be here out. And therefore, we can have that conversation. I think that's really interesting because a lot of times people think of officers in schools as like a punitive thing for the kids, but you really are framing it for them. And I think the real role that, well, one of the roles we do in schools is to protect them, that you're there to protect them. And I think that that's a, a huge thing, uh, just a shift in how they're thinking about you there. So I, I think that's awesome. Yeah. And uh, like I said, I, I really enjoyed wearing that uniform to school because Kids would come up and look and they ask me questions about the stuff that's on the uniform, what's on my tool belt. And like I said, that's just a conversation that we get to have, just breaking down those stereotypes and then ask questions. I tell them all the time, ask me questions. If something happened over the weekend that you didn't feel right about or was uncomfortable about, come and ask me. I'm here every day. I'll wear the same uniform these other officers wear out on the street. 
we're all the same and we're here to help you all. So if you've seen something or something happened that you want to ask about, here's your opportunity. Let's have this platform. Let's have this discussion. So you don't have to try to guess what happened or whatever. You have a voice right here that does mm -hmm. the same job that you can come to. I think that's probably like what you just touched on. I think that's probably like one of the biggest positives is where, of wearing your uniform at the school is they can now associate, you know, once you develop that trust, you, you then represent all the people they'll interact with on the street, all the other cops that they'll interact with, or they'll see, you know, there's not this divide like, oh, that officer's wearing like, you know, a, a vest carrier or whatever, or, you know, so they're not you know, they're not wearing a polo. So they look a little bit more intimidating. If, you know, if you're representing exactly like we are on the street, then there's not um, this disconnect between officers. You're the same officer. Look at, I mean, now you're back on patrol. Um, yeah. You know, if I can ask, you know, I'm curious how the events of the summer, uh, and this is a huge like can of worms question, but how the events of the summer have affected you personally and professionally? Um how it affected me personally um I, I try to live my life by a certain code you know control the things that i can the things that i cannot control don't worry about you know and living my life like that helps me put a lot of stuff in perspective and so when all the events over the summer kicked off um what i felt i can do is go to the people that i know and then try to have that conversation try to have that dialogue with that open communication where we can talk about what's going on because before all that stuff happened, you knew who I am, who I was, you know who I am. So therefore, just because all that happened doesn't mean I changed. I all of a sudden came and came to be this bad person or unless you thought I was a bad person before you met me. So therefore, but let's talk about it now. Let, let's see why everybody's up in arms and all this stuff is going on. So. I didn't let it affect me personally. It just made me wonder, does everybody out there in this crowd feel like that? Or is there another driving force for a lot of these people out there to be out there? Is this an opportunity to hang out because COVID's out there and there's no summer events going on. So this is the happening thing to do, or you really have a problem with the police. So that's how I kind of looked at it. That's why I wanted more feedback from the community about it. Not just shouting at me, not just yelling at us standing on the line because we know there's nothing gonna get accomplished that way. When that happened to me, all I would do is just take a step back. I would use my 6'6 frame and just look over top of everybody and just not make eye contact and then just, just let them yell. And that's one thing that I learned about playing professional sports you have to know how to turn that ear off to some comments and criticism because you don't want to hear everything going on out there and because it could affect your game or if they draw you in now they want so therefore just be professional I have my sunglasses on this tinted you can't see my eyes and i'm looking directly over the crowd so they're out there yelling all they want but you hear certain things that you pick up that you're like okay that was an interesting comment but I never engage with them in that aspect to let them upset me and go on and try to go against them because, like I said, at the end of the day, I know who I am. Yeah, I didn't have the uh, luxury of being as tall as you are, but I tried to employ some of those same tactics of just, you know, almost meditating and trying not to let it get to me. But I, I definitely, uh, I think it was very difficult for, well, I'm sure for you, but for us that were standing next to you and other officers, black officers, just the, the stuff that was being said to you just felt like you would never hear it anywhere else in a civilized society. And it just, it, it hurt in a way that like, it was hard to explain because you wanted to like stick up, like, no, you don't say that, but you can't, you just have to stay, stand there, yeah. you know? And, and another thing that I learned, you know, it's 2021 now, that was happening back in 2020. And my dad grew up in the South. My parents grew up in the South. My dad's 80 years old. So when he would tell me some stories about him growing up, you can feel the conversation. You can feel what was going on at that time when him and his friends are sitting around telling me these stories. So it, it almost like, like I say, it reach inside you and touch your soul, what they're saying. So 
all the way to 2020 when I'm out there and this crowd is just shouting these chants and slogans and some of the things that they're saying, you can tell it just doesn't sound true. So therefore it just brush it off. It, it doesn't affect me because they're trying to get under your skin. Back then when my dad was living uh, in the South, back in the 40s and 50s when he was growing up, that was real then. That was real. This stuff today wasn't real. Like I said, some of these people really didn't feel like that. These people were just saying something to try to get under your skin, trying to get you to engage so they could have you on film and put you out there, stuff like that. But back then, they were actually really, truly scared and terrified to go different places. And they really did have to look over and watch their back. So after the summer, um, I know you and I sort of started working with a group of community members and trying to get that over that just screaming and not having a real conversation. Um, how has that affected you just having kind of those people that obviously are willing and hungry for that communication and not for the, just the, the everybody's bad type of. Yeah. And, and that's a key thing too. It, it's some people now want to come out and they want to talk and have real dialogue, real conversation, because some of them feel that they can come to me because they've known me before. So, but then the funny part is some people are still, too worried about everyone else to come up and have these conversations. But how do we move forward if somebody doesn't want to take that step to get it done? So therefore, that's why I'll put myself out there. You know who I am. I'm a police officer. You know who I used to be. And I'm the same person. I just wear a different uniform now. I don't wear a basketball uniform or football uniform anymore. I wear a police uniform, but I'm the same person. So you can come up to me at any time and talk. And when I'm out there on patrol, I do the same thing. I go talk to people at the grocery store. I pull over while I'm driving and talk to people. And so it just, I just want to show myself still as a human being, therefore I'm trying to make people comfortable to come up and talk to me. So you still get people like, mm, I don't know if I'm ready yet, but when you're ready, I'll be here. That's what I just let them know. When you're ready, I'll be, I'm not going anywhere. So when you're comfortable, let's do it. Have, pe have people taken advantage of that and actually come up and surprise you by having these hard conversations oh yeah it, it's happened a lot so I've, I've often had people in the community come up to me and talk to me and someone be like well um I, I was just wondering the way they try to frame their question but yeah hey, hey let's have a conversation you know I, I know it's tough for some people but as long as we're making a step in the right direction to talk about it let's do it you know if you have another question for me later on call me, call the South Precinct, uh, leave me a message and I'll get back with you when I can. But um, let's not be afraid to improve our community. So how would you encourage, I think you have a great advantage of having grown up in the place that you work now and you know parents and you know people, um, you know, being a professional athlete, you have this sort of stature that uh, makes you really interesting. So what advice would you give to people you work with, other officers that don't have that advantage? They're just sort of your standard officer that maybe moved here from Central America and aren't familiar with the community. The community doesn't know them. Uh, what would you say to them? How, how do they break down those barriers? Yeah, Lexi, I'm, I'm right here. I can hear you. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> uh, what, I, what I say to uh, officers like that, if you work in that community, I, I feel it's part of our job to get to know that community, you know, because they're going to see you every day, you know, so even if we have to be the first ones to make the initial, hello, how you're doing? How hard is that? Hello, how you doing can go a long way. You know, if you have a little spade up your sleeve that you can pull out and use, like maybe, you know, a different language or something, you can interact with somebody like that. Bring up that language or something, say something to them in that language. Now, that's been a real big door opener for me, you know, traveling the world, going, being in different countries. I don't speak fluent any language, but I know a few words of some languages that I throw out there every now and again. And it's like a light bulb that goes off. So, oh, wow. So you were interested to learn about my background. So therefore, let me learn a little bit about you. So that's kind of like a door opener. Find something that you can play with to open a person up or just capture somebody's attention. And um, being a police officer, 
we're here to protect and serve and um, helpers of the community. So I want to be a helper of the community. So as other officers, I think we all should be helpers of the community. You know, we go to some crazy calls, you know, but sometimes people need us at a time of need and when they're really down, if we can try to do something to show that we do care about the community and them as a person, instead of just there to try to fix the problem as much as we can and then move on, let's show a little bit of compassion in what we do. And therefore, I think that plays a lot into what we do. Sometimes for me, I know some of the backing officers I'm with be like, this dude talk too much, but <laughs> <laughs> this is who I am. You know, if, if you're ready to clear, you know, we can clear at whenever time it is, but I want the person that I'm dealing with at that moment to know that I'm telling you these things because I'm here to help you. If you need my assistance, I'm here. Maybe you don't want to do it now because whatever's going on, but you need me at a later date, I'm going to be that same person that you can talk to at a later date, but I'm not just going to write you off like a number. Don't any Nobody wants to be just a number. So if you can make them feel important, special at that time, that means a lot. Wow. Um, you guys might have covered this when I stepped out for a second, but I... I know that you had your view of police officers growing up and you kind of viewed them in the realm of with first responders and nurses and doctors and lawyers as you know somewhat leaders and people you looked up to and I'm just curious I know you said that's your experience and that's your that was you know your story and so you're not going to take on someone else's story you're going you know it's not fair essentially to do that um but I'm I'm curious if you know a lot of people growing up who had bad uh, relationships with officers and for very valid reasons. And if you can talk about, you know, how maybe maybe the tides have shifted a little bit in places like, you know, Rainier Beach and, and things like that, where maybe it's not like it was. And, and why is that? Or, you know, maybe it is the same. Do you have an insight to that? Um, yeah, like you said, I, I, I grew up in the South End, went to Rainier Beach. I had a lot of friends and associates that did uh, perceived the police to be negative, did have a lot of bad interactions with police officers. And even me growing up, going to Rainier Beach, I had a few bad encounters with police officers. But uh, just for me, like I said, my story, I knew a lot of good officers to compensate for the ones that I had that negative experience with. So therefore, I didn't let it taint what I thought of policing or police officers because something negative happened to me with a, an officer or two. And the way I look at it is like this. There's bad people in every profession. There's bad people all over the world. There's good people in every profession and all over the world. So as an individual, it's up to you whether you let them persuade you to go right or left. You know, it's, it's totally up to you. And like I said, I have friends that had bad interactions and I can understand where they were coming from because sometimes they would tell me these stories that went on here and they may have gotten this happened to him with this police officer. And so I'm like, oh, wow, really? Damn, okay, yeah, yeah, that's crazy. Oh, wow. So what are you gonna do about it? You know, are you gonna take them to court? Are you gonna do this? Are you gonna do that? And then that's the thing that kind of rubbed me the wrong way is when somebody has something negative or bad happen to them, but they didn't wanna do anything about it. Instead of, okay, being mad and now you feel this way about everybody, that's why we have a court system. At least try it. Now, if it doesn't work for you, then that's a whole nother story. But just to have some built up anger or animosity because something happened and you didn't try to do anything to rectify that, I don't know. It's just interesting to me. That's a very think, mature mindset, I think. Yeah. And I yeah. think that that's definitely one of, to me, the, the frustrating things that has happened uh, both here and nationwide is, is sort of separating the police from any interaction besides uh, like a 911 call or an arrest situation, you know, taking police out of schools, taking police out of community events, saying that it's a, a negative thing to have police involved, I think is really detrimental to the overall perception and ability to work within a community because you do need to have both from an officer's perspective and from a community perspective, you need to have those opportunities for positive interaction or else the only time you see us is when we're going to come and, uh, you know, respond to the worst day of your life. And that's just not 
I mean, we can do all we can to make it a good situation, but it, it's important to have those positive interactions. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. And um, yeah, and just like you said, I think if they had have kept us in school, I think that was a moment where the kids could come in, like I would do, the kids can come in and sit down and have an open discussion with you. Because one thing that I've learned in school, when something like that happens, you know, I'd have my crew of kids that always come up and hang around me and talk to me. So we'll start talking about something and they have the platform. Tell me how you feel, no holds barred. I'm not your parents and I'm not a teacher. I'm a police officer and I'd like to be your friend. So let's talk about it. So they have the open mic. And so we'll be engaging in something. And then you see some kids over to the side who maybe don't want to talk to me or don't like me, but they're, they're in the distance and they're listening. Then they end up getting closer and they end up getting closer. And the next thing you know, they're front and center. Now they're giving me their two cents. And, and that's all it's about. If we're there, now it's their chance to get it off their chest and feel that their voice has been heard. And when you take that away from them, now you just leave them out there to still be pent up and have that animosity. Because to believe it or not, there's a lot of the kids that do want to talk to you. They do want to have that relationship with you and or judge for themselves what's going on instead of being peer pressured by this group that, oh, well, you have to go this direction. So, but yeah, I think that was one of the biggest things that affected me is because now I have to go out and find these kids in the community versus being able to see them every day. I wrote, I wrote down what you said um, when you were saying like, I'm not your teacher, I'm not your parent. You said, I'm a police officer and I'd like to be your friend. And like, it's so simple. And I, you're probably like, that's a ridiculous thing to write down, but it is so simple. And it sounds like so genuine and sweet. It's, it's, a, it's who you are, you know? Um, yeah. I mean, it's just, uh, I think you can be both. Like Lexi once said to me a long time ago, two things can be true at the same time. You know, you can be a police officer and be for law and order. And you can also just want to be someone's friend in that capacity, you know? Oh yeah, exactly. So I, I've met a lot of cool officers that I still have great relationships with from when I was in school till now that I'm a police officer and they're officers now. And sometimes I bring it up to them. Oh yeah, you remember when you when we met at the basketball game or whatever, I'll, I'll just throw him out there. We're good friends. He might find this uh, humorous, but uh, Wayne Johnson, we work together now. But I remember when I was trying to get on as a police officer, I met him at a, uh, I seen him at a basketball game. So I went up and I talked to him. One of my friends introduced me to him. And so he like, yeah, yeah, we'd love to have you on the Seattle Police Department because we're cool like that. And so he wrote his name down on a piece of paper and everything and uh, gave me his phone number and everything and gave it to me. And like maybe a month ago, I was at work getting, um, getting ready to go on patrol. So I'm digging through my pockets and I found that card. And this was four years ago. And I pulled it out and I'm like, hey, Wayne, check this out. And then we had a laugh about it. Oh, man, you're dating me now. You're dating me. Like, oh, but you're cool, man. You're cool like that. That's awesome. That's a really yeah. nice story. <laughs> and I love that, uh, like you've talked quite a few times uh, prior to this conversation, but about officers being at your games. And I just think that that is such a great sort of representation of like, yeah, we're here to support you. You're playing, we're cheering you on, we're on your side. You know, do you think that's a good opportunity to sort of show some support in that aspect? Oh yeah, it's a great opportunity because you run into these people all the time. You know, you, you've been around them, you've seen them, you cheered for them, you got to know them. And then, so when we're not in uniform, when we're just human beings walking, doing our daily talk, I like to be, I can go up to you like, hey, what's up? You had a good game, you know, and have that interaction. And therefore it still be that, that friendly conversation, that friendly vibe, instead of us looking at each other negative because of what we normally wear. But I watched you at the basketball game. I made you, I was making sure you were safe at the basketball game. Now you see me in line in the grocery store. Why not? Why can't we have that conversation? Hey, what's up, man? How you doing? You know, I think, I think that shows the community in us. You know, not just the job titles, but the community. And if more people did that in the community, I think that's how people get to know each other. You that's know, what makes it warm. It reminds me of uh, that. Reminds me of when I saw my my PE teacher in. Um, speaking of dating yourself, in a, like a blockbuster video one time when I was in high school. 
And I like, I go down this aisle and there he is. He's just like picking out like a thriller or some shit. And I just stand back and I like look at him and he looks over and I go, look at you. Like, I'm like, look at you picking out a video. And he's like, yeah, I'm picking out a video. How's it going? And I'm like, well, look at you. You're just doing normal people stuff. So it was just shocking for me to see like even a teacher just doing like a completely normal thing. So. Oh yeah, I, I, I totally get it. I totally get it. Especially like you said, now that we're getting older to have somebody young doing the same thing. And then they see me outside of the uniform and they're like, Officer Alice, like you're a normal human being. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's funny like that. Uh, Roselle, do you still work on your cars a lot? Yeah, I still do. Um, I haven't been able to get in the garage as much as I want just due to having the kids and trying to make sure their needs and wants come before mine. But every, every opportunity I get, I'm in their garage doing something. That's great. I remember when we were on patrol, you showed me pictures of your, your sweet purple car. Yeah. So I'm still working on it. I'm still working on it. It's a thing in uh, progress, but um, it's getting there pretty soon. I'll reveal it and be driving it on a daily basis, but it's getting there. So is there any, is there anything else that um, a lot of people in police work have left? And I'm just curious if, you know, I think the mentality is that new officers come on, they're not going to know it any different. This is, they're kind of just starting from this point moving forward. They don't know how things used to be or um, how people used to perceive police. Um, I'm just curious if you have advice for those like young officers coming in. Um, I mean, you've got, you've got a ton of life experience, you're active in your community and now you've got, you know, police experience. And I'm, I'm just curious if you could, say something to them to keep their their mind right through all this craziness yeah um and what i try to tell them because my nephew he's one of the brand new officers just coming on and so i tell him remember who you are as a person before you took this job and you want to be that same person when you get ready to retire from this job so with that being said um just be open you're coming in at a at a time when police is changing so embrace the new change of what the, the direction the, the apartment is going, you know, you're going to hear the stories of what used to happen in the past and stuff like that. So listen, because it's always valuable to know what went on then to what's going on now, but it's, it's a new day in policing. You're coming on at a time of change and embrace it and learn from it and put your spin on it, what you want it to be, you know, um, you can look up to a certain officer and like, okay, I like the way they work. You know, you, all, you can always take tools from officers. I took one from you as my partner, just the way you go about your daily uh, routine. Same with Lexi. There's a lot of officers out there that I looked at like, hmm, I like the way they did that. I want to apply that to the way I do policing and therefore take it on for what it means to you. So like I said, make sure you get to know the people in your community that you're working, protecting and serving every day. That'll help you out. And uh, just don't get jaded by someone else's story. Make sure you have your story and your vision and I think you'll be fine. I think your nephew told me that he thinks he can take you in basketball. Yeah, I, you know how many times I heard that? I wish I had a dollar every time I heard that. <laughs> I would definitely be retired. But, um, yeah, I, I like when people tell me that. Sometimes I just sit back and smile like, yeah, yeah. But I'm, I'm open whenever they want to get in the gym. Let's do it. Last time I went to the gym, I took one shot, went in. Damn, oh, just walked out. And that's all you needed. Oh, wow. I'm 100%. One for one, I'm 100%. I, I don't need to shoot anymore. Yeah, don't even change clothes. You just exactly. go in there. Yeah. Just, are you ready? Just swish, walk on out. That's awesome. I'm not really sure that that's the way like most athletes would would recommend uh, keeping your skills up. Like, I, I mean, don't they take like thousands and thousands of shots even before practice starts? Yeah, yeah, that's the thing. You know, I'm done with practicing. So when I go and I hit that one, 100%, I'm done. That's awesome. If I miss, then I'll take another one. But uh, first one go in, leave it but again. You, but you don't miss. That's the point. That's it. That's it. <laughs> hundred percent. You can't take that down. You can't get 101%. <laughs> uh, Lex, did you have anything else for Roselle or anything Roselle that you wanted to, to chat about that maybe we didn't touch on that's kind of important to you right now? 
I, I did have a question for you to circle back a little bit. Um, you talked a lot about like letting people ask you questions and um, have that open dialogue. I think it's easy a lot of times for us to feel very defensive. Um, it's just sort of human nature, right? How do you combat that, that feeling and just let people talk to you and get their voice out? Yeah, um, and like I said, for me, it, it all stemmed from me playing sports because being a professional athlete, you hear it all. And so you know when a person's coming at you in a negative way, trying to get under your skin, and you know when a person generally is frustrated and they have a question. So just have that open ear to listen. And then if they're saying something that I feel that they could be attacking on, I'll ask them. So wh what are you saying right now? Are you talking to me or are you talking at me? Which, which mm -hmm. What's happening right now? Because I want to have this conversation, but I'm not going to sit here and be attacked because therefore that just shuts down communication because therefore we're going to be going back and forth and that's not what I want to do. Now, if you can form that in sort of a question or rephrase what you want to ask me and then go from there, then let's do it. Let's, let's try to take the heat out of it. Let's take that argument tone out of it and just have that conversation. Therefore, that's, that's what's called healthy conversation because I'm not interested in trying to argue with you because that's not what I do. I don't argue. That's not fun for me. It wouldn't be fun for them and we're not going to get anything out of it. So if you need to take a time out of pause and take a deep breath and then, okay, let me, let me rephrase that and then go, let's do it. Like I said, I'm not going nowhere. You're not going to make me run because you bring up something that was heated and had some fire on it. I'll just say, cool it down and then ask me again so we can get something out of it because that's what we want at the end of the day. We want to get something out of it. We don't want to just throw rocks at each other. Man, you have, you have, you're just like a, you're like a large Yoda. You have so much just great insight and I don't know where it comes from. Is it life experience or did you have some like very formative leaders or people in your family? Because you, I mean, you have such a, I, I don't know what the term is, but like just a good grasp on how best to approach these issues without getting too fired up. You know, I'm not sure that I even have like the ability to not allow myself to get an S to an escalated point. I mean, it's something that I work on constantly, but, but how did you get to that mindset? And that's it. It took me a while to get there because when I was younger, this wasn't the job for me. I didn't have the mindset that I have now to do this job and um, come from, my family growing up, just the lessons that they taught me, mom, dad, and my sisters, and my younger brother, the coaches that I had in my life, I always had great coaches. I had some bad coaches, but I had some good coaches. And like one of my coaches always told me, sometimes there's a lesson to be learned in a negative, in a negative lesson. You know, you got to look for the good in that and see what it is and figure it out. So not everybody's gonna be your friend, not everybody's here to help you, but in some kind of way, you can learn something positive out of that. And so, and then just traveling the world, being put in different situations till I had to figure out right from wrong. You know, when you're traveling the world by yourself, you have to learn and figure out some stuff quick and fast. And so just as I get older, sit back and relax and think about these things, it, it kind of, changed who I was. You know, a lot of people know the incident I had a long time ago with the referee. That was one of the biggest experiences in my life that helped me realize that uh, everything's not about me. And it taught me a lot. And that was my first action, uh, my first encounter with de-escalation right there. If I knew how to de-escalate then, I probably would be sitting here talking to you guys now. But uh, but I, I took it as a positive. Like I said, even if it was a negative experience for me, I took it as a positive because it put me on a path to learn, to find out who I am as a person. And uh, once I hit that road, I never look back. So. Wow. Well, that's, a, that's that growth mindset of, you know, not letting something like that stop you in your tracks and define who you are forever, but say, okay, what can I do to learn from this and grow and exactly like you said who am i as a person that's that's huge not all, everybody has that growth mindset yeah and, and that's exactly what it was because at that moment it was on espn every news channel that you could think of so everybody's seen it and 
today, people still bring that incident up to me. And that happened back in 98. And they still remember this. Say, some of you remember what I was doing that day, but they don't even remember what they were doing on that day. And I think that was a, a point in my life where a lot of people wanted to see me fall and not get back up. But I use it as a learning tool. Like, th this is not going to define me. This is not who I am. I made a mistake. Now I have to learn from it. Whatever comes from this, I'm willing to embrace it, take it on, and show who I really am. Yeah, that's incredible. I mean, at the end of the day, we're all just we're all just people and we all make mistakes and, yeah. you know, and, and you are just, just the way you articulate how you're able to move past it and take the negative and turn it into a positive. And like you said, sort of, um, define who you are like moving forward and not look back. That's like a huge thing, not looking back, not dwelling on anything. Um, I think that that's just incredible. And I mean, I think that's a, I mean, I think that's a great kind of point to end it on unless Lexi, you have anything else. No, I think that's been awesome. Thank you for talking to us. Oh, no problem. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it because this was fun. I apologize for uh, Josie uh, crying and everything. We both got tested for COVID today and I had to step out because I got a call negative. So yeah, that's positive. Yeah, there we yeah. go. That's positive. There we go. <laughs> they turn, take my negative and turn it into a positive. There's so no positive. There it is. <laughs> so we're, it turns out we're just really like unhealthy or something. So <laughs> um, no, but I, I appreciate it. Appreciate taking the time. And um, man, I look forward to when we're, you know, able to get things up and running with the department and um, having you hop on for some of the projects that we're doing and um, hopefully maybe lifting together at some point when all these restrictions lift and everything and everything. So hopefully you'll be down for that. I'm down for that. And Lexi said that she can take you in basketball. So I know how you like a challenge. I'm oh, ready yeah. for that one too. <laughs> you two versus me. She'll be on my shoulders. So And I'll even spot you. We'll go to 10. I'll give you nine. If you, if you want to get really frustrated at watching somebody's form in basketball, I'm happy to accommodate that. <laughs> I can't ever figure out which leg's supposed to go up when you're doing a layup. Is it the same side or the opposite side? I don't Whichever even know. Whichever one you want. Whichever one you want. All right. You, you heard it here, people. I've been doing it right no matter how I've been doing it. So. <laughs> All right, you guys. Take care. All right. Thanks for having me.